Matt, there's a kind of a perception, and we, we've seen it on Accounting Web as well, that um, that accountants don't really want anything to do with with uh, with auto enrollment, and and they're kind of avoiding that. Why do you think that there is this perception that uh, that accountants are avoiding AE? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it's quite well known that advisors in general are um, sort of stepping back from AE quite a quite a large percentage of them, and obviously mm. we've got. Uh, uh, an advisor platform that we work with 6,000 advisors that are registered on our platform um, and we talk to advisors every day so our experience and also the studies out there show some of the reasons why. Um, firstly they say it's not deemed profitable enough or maybe not deemed part of their core business. Um, there's also a lack of expertise and knowledge around auto enrollment. In fact there was a recent Helm Godfrey study the, they did a big, Helm got through a, a large employee benefits organisation and they did a big survey of accountants in the UK and also SMEs. And nearly 50% mm. of the accountants they spoke to said that um, they were purely sending clients directly to the government scheme Nest um, without mm. apparently analysing whether Nest was the best fit for the client and met the criteria of both the employer and the employee. And also around 50% of the advisors they spoke to, all the accountants they spoke to, said that they felt they had a lack of expertise and knowledge in the area. Mm. Also a lot of them say that payroll and data management are an extremely difficult area to advise on. And there is an assumption that, um, an incorrect assumption, that recommending a pension scheme uh, constitutes giving financial advice and is regulated. Um, it's easy to find out that that is not the case. So if you go on the ACCA website, we're actually um, partnered with the ACCA this year to do roadshows to educate their members on the fact that they can actually engage with auto enrollment and monetize it. We've done a series of six roadshows with them already. Mm. Um, and on their website it shows that the FCA state that it's not a regulated activity. And you can also go on the ICAW website and they've produced a traffic light guide. And if you notice in green is go and get the auto enrollment business, you can recommend a partner as long as you recommend at a company level and not at an individual level. Mm. Great. And when it comes to um, you know, why, why a client would go to an advisor for AE, what would be the great advantage? What, what, why are they coming to advisors, would you say? Sure. I, th there's two main things spring to mind, really. Um, firstly, it's got a perception of being a very complicated process. Um, mm. As an employer, you have 33 legal requirements um, as part of your auto-enrollment duties. Also, the financial implications of getting it wrong. So if I look at the first one first, the 33 requirements, um, I'm not going to go into all of them because we've got a time constraint today, but if I cover some of the key ones. Sure. So the first thing the employer has to do is educate his employees on auto enrolment so they understand what the process is. Then he has to select a, uh, a suitable provider that, that suits the needs of himself or herself and their employees. Um, they then have to automatically enrol all eligible workers onto the scheme. They have to then make all the non-eligible job holders um, aware that there is an auto enrolment scheme and if they want to opt in they have to manage the opt-in process. Mm -hmm. They then have to manage all the opt-outs from the eligible workers that don't want to be in the scheme and they have to go submit a declaration of compliance to the pensions regulator and keep records for six years. That's just touching on some of the main ones. Mm -hmm. There's also a number of things that they, they mustn't do and that is to encourage people to opt out and also to uh, operate discriminatory recruitment processes that discourage auto enrolment. Mm. If we look at the fines that you can get from the pensions regulator, there's a host of penalties that they throw at you. So, for instance, the, the first one is a, a, a fixed penalty notice, which is basically a £400 on the spot fine. The next and more serious is an escalating penalty notice, and that can range from £50 to £10,000, depending on the size of the business. Then there's the one that I always get wrong because it is a very long drawn out title, the Prohibitive Recruitment Conduct Penalty Notice. First time I've ever got it right. Um, <laughs> and that ranges between £1,000 and £5,000. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a, a civil penalty which is basically a failure to uh, pay um, contributions and that could be up to £50,000. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't actually stop there. 
because you get 28 days to pay a fine if you are fined by the pensions regulator. And there is quite a high instance of businesses not paying the fines within the 28 days. And if that does happen, not only do you get serious reputational and brand damage, but you can also get credit score damage. So it will go on the rec uh, credit record of the company for six years and may affect the business's mm. ability to borrow money in the future. Mm. Sounds very complicated yeah. and obviously there's some, some serious penalties there if you don't get it right. Correct. Um, I mean, how do you go about actually monetizing something like AE? So from an advisor's point of view, your clients will fall into four categories. Um, and advisors often think that only one or two of the categories are potential business for them, but actually all four are. So the first one is small businesses that are still to stage, it's the obvious one. But that mm. splits into two categories. So firstly, there are the small businesses still to stage that are your clients. Um, in that case, you want to make sure that you contact them by email, phone and letter and make them aware of A, how complicated it is and B, the potential fines that they could get from this and offer your assistance to help. Um, you can even find out two thirds of companies don't know what their staging date is and you can find out their staging date with the staging date calculator you can access from the Smart Pension website or from the Pension Regulators website. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, you, the one thing you don't want is your clients to go and do the process, get it wrong, get fined and then come after you with a blame thrower because you're their advisor and you should have advised them better. The mm. other the section of that category is uh, uh, clients out there that are crying for advice but you haven't engaged with them there. In that Helm Godfrey study I cited earlier, 74% of the SMEs they spoke to said they wanted to go to an advisor and 59% mm. of them said that advisor would be their accountant and that shot up to 70% for anyone with four or less employees. So there's a lot mm. of business out there. Yeah. Great, it's good information, thank you, Matt. Pleasure. Um, and there was just one other thing around kite marks. I was just hoping you could kind of explain a little bit of that uh, to our audience as well. Sure, so there are three main kite marks in the industry. The first one, which is actually the gold standard in the interest industry, is the Master Trust Assurance Framework. And that mm -hmm. was created by the ICAEW in conjunction with the pensions regulator themselves, and it's classed as the gold standard and it shows that there's a very high level of governance, administration and management. It's extremely hard to get, it takes mm. a very long time, there's a lot of hoops to jump through and it's quite expensive. So any provider that has actually got the Master Trust Assurance Framework you know is in it for the long game. And there are actually about 100 Master Trusts out there and only just over 10 have got the Master Trust Assurance Framework. Mm -hmm. The next one to look for is de facto rating. So de facto, I'm sure everybody's heard of de facto, it's a very well known, very re well respected third party assessor of financial products and it gives products a rating between one and five stars, one being not so good, five being excellent and it shows the product is um, comprehensive and robust. Mm -hmm. And then there's the pensions quality mark. Um, which basically shows it meets uh, scheme meets um, basic criteria in communications uh, in and, and two other criteria. So those are the three marks you need to look mm. for.